uh, presentation at the Sprott Conference. This is me, Keith Barron. I'm the chairman and CEO, and I'm also the founder of the company. Uh, just be forewarned, I will be making forward-looking statements. So what we're going to do, because this is all so very strange and different, I'm going to do something a little bit different here from the standard deck. 15-minute uh, lightning round like on Kramer. And I don't expect you to make a, uh, an investment decision after 15 minutes. But I'm hoping that you're going to be sufficiently intrigued to watch the second half and uh, do your own due diligence and uh, hopefully ask us a bunch of questions. I'm going to do a very, very quick project overview here. Here we are in southeastern Ecuador, right near the border with Peru. We're in what's called the Cordillera de Cudicu. It's um, the foothills of the Andes. It's behind the high Andes. This is not high in elevation. Maximizes about 2,600 meters, but a lot of it is much lower. It's 208,000 hectares that we have. That's over half a million acres of land. Never, ever been looked at by a mining company. In fact, the last people who were in here doing anything were the Spanish conquistadors, and they got booted out of here in 1605. So... You can see a trend coming through, or a geological trend, and we see a whole bunch of labels down here. And these are known deposits. Ferdinand del Norte went in production. It's a gold deposit, gold silver, went in production last November. Mirador is a copper porphyry, went in production last July. And uh, this area has been heavily examined by exploration companies, but not this area. Why? Various reasons. There is a river coming through here called the Santiago River. It's the only one that flows uh, to the east and into the Amazon Basin. It occupies a deep canyon, and until fairly recently, infrastructure didn't carry up and into this area up here. So uh, it was infrastructurally challenged, and companies just didn't go here. Plus, there was no database, so they weren't really all that interested. What have we got, though? We have found a whopping 20 epithermal gold-silver targets. We're still looking for two historical mines. I'll talk about them in a minute. Sediment hosted, we found copper and silver in shales and sandstone on surface going for a whopping 23 kilometers. That's 16 miles. We found a copper-silver gold, uh, a copper-silver lead zinc, sorry, <laughs> silver lead zinc, uh, mantos, mantos means uh, blanket in Spanish. That goes for 15 kilometers. And porphyry, we have eight copper targets that we have field checked and and, and shown uh, to be there. They're drill ready. And plus we have 23 additional geophysical targets. There is nobody out in the junior mining space who has this collection of targets. This is like having a jewel box. It's an incredible thing. And this is one of the reasons why I keep dumping money in. <laughs> so why was Arania invited to the Sprott Conference in the first place? Well, from my last uh, last company, Aurelian Resources, which I started in 2001, we went from a low of 30 cents all the way up to a mass of $43. That's a 10,000% increase. The predecessor to Sprott Inc., Sprott Asset Management, actually dumped a million bucks into the original private placement when we went public. And, of course, they got diluted down over time, but it ended up being the biggest win that they ever had. In fact, they had to start selling down Aurelian shares to balance because it became, uh, percentage-wise, just too much. Isn't that an incredible uh, problem to have? <laughs> Here I am looking like a proud papa at 12 boxes of visible gold. Of course, my beard was a lot darker back then. And here I am uh, just last November at the grand opening of the mine. And this is from the first pour, uh, gold, silver, brick. Uh, the reason I'm showing this is because I want to illustrate that you can get things done in Ecuador. Uh, some of the nay naysayers think it's not possible. London Gold has gone ahead, permitted the mine. They are uh, exporting uh, gold and silver and repatriating profits uh, back to Canada and sharing with the, the, the shareholders. So does Arania management have any skin in the game? Because that's always a question that I get asked. Well, I own 50% of the company. I don't draw any salary like many, many other junior 
mining companies, management owns shares, mostly employees of stock options, and even right down to the, the guys who are getting muddy in the field, they have stock options. They're very, very motivated to make discoveries. What's the time frame and what is your exit strategy? Everyone always asks this because they want to know how fast they can turn over their money. This is the famous Lasson curve that we all know and for the life cycle of a mining project. Um, the Peruvian copper thing that we have is way down here. It still uh, hasn't been awarded to us yet. Uh, the, the claims are pending. Our porphyry story in Ecuador is probably up here. Pre-discovery, as I said, we're going to be drilling in August next month. Uh, the, the gold uh, story is a little bit lagged behind here. One thing I wanted to show here, unlike some of our competitors elsewhere in Ecuador who have talked about building a mining dynasty, that is not on my agenda personally. Uh, I know from personal experience, I've been in the business 36 years, that um, it takes a long time to get a mine operated, uh, uh, operating and approved uh, through all the environmental hurdles and all the rest of it. It's a lot longer than a typical business cycle political cycle and what will happen is your share price is going to go down here and you're going to get whacked and probably you are not going to be the people to take it up there because you're going to get taken out in either a friendly or a hostile takeover and that's it gone what i want to do is have four or five different projects and sell them out here uh, jv them and then move them on and into uh, stronger t hands. I think that's the best course for anybody. No one on my board, nobody in my company has any mining experience. We haven't built them. So we have drill ready targets. The heavy lifting is done, folks. We expect to be drilling the end of August. So what's our capital structure? Well, the company is 13 years old. It only has 40.7 million shares out, which isn't a heck of a lot. Very, very tight capital structure. It's been public since 2013. Uh, this is what our graph looks like. As of yesterday, we are at 138 million market cap. Um, we do have 4.4 million in debt. That's Canadian, but it's owed to me. And I'm not going to be calling the debt soon. Uh, I'm not going to go <laughs> and, and, and wreck things for myself here. Remember, I, I own about 50% of this company. Um, so, you know, I consider myself to be very, very much aligned with the shareholders, very much aligned. And um, so who's on the Irania board? I get asked this question a lot. It's like a who's who of the mining business here. And these people have been handpicked, um, obviously, uh, to help out with corporate governance and, and uh, provide comfort uh, to um, our shareholders and vigilance. Uh, but also they are very, very experienced in the mining business and very, very connected. Uh, Richard Spencer, my right-hand guy, is the president of the company. He's got 10 years experience in Ecuador, five of that running I Am Gold, came up with the Loma Larga gold discovery. Uh, I want to just mention Alfred here, uh, one of my directors. Alfred is a Knight of the Vatican and actually introduced me to the Vatican Bank. Uh, they haven't come in as investors yet anyway, but how many junior miners can say that they have met with people from the Vatican Bank? Not many. Some would say having so much land is like a liability rather than an asset. What do I think? Well, I think that having a big, big land position is very important because the chances of making discovery on a poacher's stamp is very remote and especially a world-class one. So we're doing it here. Uh, we've already covered about 60% of the property, and that's much greater than all the property that we had in Arillion back in 2008. We had 96,000 hectares then. We got uh, 208,000 now. Project risk, what, is, what would I say is the biggest project risk? Well, these are our stakeholders. The reason I put the picture of the kids in here Everyone universally around the world wants their kids to do better than they did. They want them to have more opportunities. These are members of the Schwar indigenous community. They live on our, our project area uh, and they are our stakeholders. Uh, but uh, just by illustration, this is going back in the archives here. 
Mrs. Sanchez's class from La Zarza in 2004, and these kids have got packages with a whole bunch of materials, uh, educational materials, and then it says, Educación para todos, education for all. Now, I wanted to show this because these kids are now in their 20s, and they're working at Fruta del Norte, or they're working in peripheral industries around it, uh, providers and such. Mining can be sustainable. It is sustaining this community. It's allowing the people to stay on the land, stay with their social network, the social contacts, stay with their families. It's a wonderful thing. So we have health initiatives. We have educational initiatives going with the people. This is our COVID response. We've sent 18 tons of food in. We're providing, uh, uh, pr we have a doctor working full time on, on this problem and we're doing everything necessary to, pre to uh, preserve the health of our stakeholders in our communities. The Lost Cities, where does that figure into the story? Because it's part of the title, right? Well, this project initiated way back in uh, 1998 when I first met a professor of history in Quito. He introduced me to this map and it was talking about uh, uh, two gold discoveries made by the Spanish conquistadors way back in the 1560s. There were actually seven famous Spanish mines uh, operating in Ecuador. All of them became lost. Five of them had been refound over the years. And uh, the two best ones, uh, Sevilla de Oro and Negroño de los Caballeros, are still missing. And this is what we found recently along a road. We found some blocks that appear to be chiseled, uh, building blocks. What are they doing there? It looks like the Spaniards left them behind. Now, if you don't like the mining, uh, the, the historical story, uh, if you're one of those uh, uh, hard-bitten analysts that I run into all the time and say that the whole thing is hokey, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. But the thing is, the retail people love this story. And this is what happened. Got me five pages in Bloomberg Businessweek. Recently in February, just before the COVID bit, I had a, a front page article in the Miami Herald. So uh, it resonates a lot with uh, the, uh, the retail community especially. And I can tell you this, if we find one of these settlements, and that would be a bonus on top of everything else that we have, this huge plethora of targets, if we were to find something, it would be front page news around the planet. Everybody would hear about Irania, and that would be a great thing. Rick Rule, I ran into him in the corridor last year at the uh, at the Sprott conference where we were invited, and he said to me, he said, you know, Keith, Irani is a better buy today at $3 than it was at 2 And I said, gosh, I got to agree with you. <laughs> and I said, why is that, Rick? And he said, because you've created so much value in the company. And I thanked him for it, but it's very true. We have found a lot of stuff in a very short period of time. We've only been at the expiration now for three and a half years in Ecuador, and we've got all these targets, 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 and we're on to our second drill campaign on the porphyry copper story. So uh, stay tuned, please, for part two. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of a, a leisurely walk uh, through the geology and uh, of our various uh, uh, targets. Thank you very much. Well, hello and welcome to part two. Now, people have said to me, um, gosh, you know, I don't know if I'm going to attend this year because uh, of the COVID. And uh, in any case, most of the deals are done in the bar after the presentations. So what I suggest is that you pause right now, pause the presentation and go get yourself a libation or a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and come back and enjoy uh, I'll be talking for the next 30 minutes, but you can imagine that I'm sitting across the table from you with the decks and presenting it to you one-on-one. -on -one. So there we go. Go ahead. <laughs> In any case, enjoy yourself. So here we go. Um, this is a map of the western coast of South America uh, with all the porphyries, the major porphyries outlined going right down the coast of Chile and up through Ecuador and into Colombia as far as Venezuela. Now, you see this conspicuous gap. 
That's where our property is sitting, and that's what we were trying to fill in. So Mirador, which went in production last July, is sitting in there, and the Fruta del Norte is sitting in there too. It is the last piece of real estate in the Cordillera of South America that has not been investigated. And as you could see already from part one, it is full of goodies. So just to recap where our property is, we're in the Cordillera de Cudicu, which is sitting here, outlined in red. The Cordillera del Condor is sitting here. That's a con continuation of the belt, and the belt comes all the way through here. Now, one thing I didn't outline in the first part is all of this orange here. This is granite basement, basement rocks. This is the basement to volcanics and sediments, which are only just little scabs on top. So most of it has been eroded away, and now you're looking at the roots. What does that mean? It means that in the case of gold and silver epithermals, most of been them have been eroded down to nothing. There's nothing left of them except the gold itself, which is residing in the rivers as placer gold. So there's been a lot of activity going back to the 1920s when prospectors were lured into this area looking for alluvial gold and then trying to chase down the sources of that gold. They, and a number, there are about 20 porphyries that have been found in here historically. Up in this area, because you haven't had that erosion to the extent, the area is tipped down to the south here, or, or tipped down to the, the north, rather. So the south has been deeply eroded. The north has not been eroded. And you see all these sediments are lying in place. However, we know that the granite, because of, we've done the magnetics over this, it underlies this area, and the area is full of porphyries. So firstly, I'm going to talk about the epithermal gold silver targets. Now, a little bit of education here for those who are not really aware of what all this means. Epithermal means close to the surface. Uh, there's always a magmatic source. Here it is down here. That's what's driving the whole system and providing the gold um, geochemically. And then there's a vein system. A vein system is just essentially uh, a system of faults, fractures that are filled in with quartz and other minerals, including potentially gold and silver. Now, this is outlined here as the gold zone, and it's got everything to do with pressure and temperature. But this is the area where the fluids, the geothermal fluids, which are coming off, the think geysers, hot springs, all that kind of stuff, which is coming up this fault zone, then coming to the surface here and expressing itself as sinter, silica sinter. Typically, that doesn't have anything in it, but it will have pathfinder uh, metals like antimony, arsenic, mercury, and other things. And I'll talk about that later. But down here, the fluids will boil. When they boil, they are no longer capable of carrying gold in solution, gold dissolved in the liquid, uh, so that it comes out of solution like that, and it forms gold in the veins. And so this is where you want to be. Up here, you're up too high, uh, and you're not going to get gold down here, you're down to the base metal zone, very, very low grade gold down here. This is the sweet spot. You got to find where you are in stratigraphy, what we call stratigraphy vertically. Where are you in the whole series here? And this is what we're trying to figure out right now. You know, at the surface, this is what the area where our project is, uh, Yowie and Crunchy Hill, this, this is what it would have looked like back in the Jurassic in the day of the dinosaurs. Um, it's a hot springs at surface. Now, on the hot spring, here's a, one bubbling away quite happily. You see all these little knobs through here. This is silica, and it's forming kind of like stalagmites uh, form in caves. This is the splash zone, and all this area is being splashed with silica-rich fluids, and it's coming out of solution, what we call precipitating, and forming these little knobs. Anything that's lying in in around the uh, the conduit here is going to get plated with silica and entombed. And much like uh, you know, insects are covered in amber and they're preserved uh, for uh, for the uh, the centuries and millennia. We see on our property at Yowie uh, these would have been reed stems 
bull rushes, things like that, living in a swampy area around these hot springs, and these have been entombed by silica. What does this mean? This means this is an indicator of paleosurface, just like dinosaur footprints would indicate to you, hey, you know what? I'm standing on a place where dinosaurs actually stood right on the surface. This is telling you that where you're standing, where this rock was collected, was right on the surface back in the, in the, in the Jurassic. Very, very important to know because, as I said, you need to know where you are top to bottom in, in the vertical sense. This is another uh, sample, again, with these reed structures entombed in silica, silica sinter. Now we got a ton of targets in terms of the epithermals. Here they are, 30 kilometers here. So this is more than 30 kilometers top to bottom. And just to put that in context, look at the geothermal field at Yellowstone National Park, where we know there's a ton of, of hot springs and geysers and things like that. It occupies almost uh, the, the whole north side of the geyser basin. You can see all these orange things and green things and actually even the blue in Yellowstone Lake. These are all hot springs. So similar sort of array, but a big, big area to explore. What would this thing have looked like back in the Jurassic? Well, a collection of, of, of lakes, uh, just like Yellowstone looks like now, and with a heat source underneath, which is supplying the heat engine and driving the whole thing. So you can see steam coming off the ground here, smoking ground, what they call smoking ground. And this is a great environment for gold. There are many, many hundreds and hundreds of examples of mines that have been found worldwide in a similar sort of epithermal setting. Uh, by way of illustration, this is a sample that I found uh, south of Fruta del Norte back around 2004. Very, very strange looking here. You see all these crisscrossing structures in here. This is uh, originally would have been calcite. It's now quartz. It's silica. It's been totally replaced. And this is what's called calcite lattice replacement texture, replacement by silica. Now, calcite uh, will form in the veins when the geothermal fluids will boil and drive off the CO2 that is contained as um, uh, dissolved fluid, dissolved gas in the, in, the, uh, in the fluids. So you have a phase change here. Immediately what happens is that calcite starts to crystallize out. So this is always when you see this, you know that fluid's boiled. Calcite's got a funny uh, situation. It's got uh, reverse solubility. So as the fluids cool, it becomes more soluble, quite the opposite of, say, a sugar cube in, in, in hot tea. Um, so as it gets cooler, it becomes more soluble, it gets dissolved away, and it gets replaced by silica, and then it gets preserved. Here's another example from Fruta del Norte itself in the drill core. And this is what we see at our Curious Prospect. Now, most of our stuff is not at the surface the present surface been eroded sufficiently to show up these things, show up this boiling texture. We suspect that it's going to be at depth, but here at Kiris, we can see this sample, which was found as a loose block in a stream, is indicating a boiling zone, and this is something, obviously, that needs to get followed up. Now, I said that up in the hot spring area, up in the center, you get pathfinder elements. And this is exactly what this is. And this is on a huge scale. Again, this is six kilometers here. And we're looking at Yowie and Crunchy Hill, the Latore group of, of, of targets. So Crunchy Hill is sitting right in here. So we have a little bit of arsenic. It's quite anomalous. Much more antimony here. Even more thallium here. And then just smoking hot for selenium. And uh, sorry, I don't know how to go back. <laughs> but um, we've got uh, a, a great bunch of targets there and uh, stuff that has to be drilled. We will be doing some geophysics on it to more accurately pinpoint the targets and, uh, and nail these things. So that's on the agenda. If it hadn't been for the COVID, we would have been doing it already right now. So porphyry style, copper and gold and 
molybdenum. So this is me back in the day, again, back in the Aurelian days, and I'm uh, working at the computer in front of a magnetic map, and there's a couple of big blobs here. These are actually copper porphyries. So they show up as very, very magnetic things, and that's because they contain a lot of an iron mineral called magnetite. Haha, <laughs> big surprise, eh? So we drilled both of these things, and we confirmed that they were porphyries. And I knew about this, and of course, this is only oh, roughly um, 90 kilometers south of where we're working now. And by extension, we should find the same thing on our property. And hey, presto, that's exactly what we did. We did an airborne survey over the whole property as a first step um, when we acquired it. And we spent a million bucks. You can see the stinger out the front of the helicopter. That's the magnetic sensor. We did radiometrics as well, looking for potassium anomalies because potassium is often an indicator of porphyry or of gold. So we did that over the whole thing. And this is part of uh, what resulted. Now, the, the, the colors here, the hot colors are magnetic zones. And this is only a small fraction of the airborne magnetic map that we did. And superimposed on it, we've put a soil grid. So we've uh, every 50 meters or so, we've taken a soil sample through here. You can see all the points through here. And this is on Senken N2 and Senken N3. And you can see some a very big coherent anomaly here and another one over here. We haven't got up to N4 yet, but we will be doing that. Now, the numbers are not huge, and I'll explain that in a second. But look at this. Isn't this curious how this L shape here? What the heck is that? Because we sampled there, we didn't get anything. Sampled over here, got virtually nothing. And then over here, you can see it dies off right in that under the N2 and over in this zone as well. And we scratched our heads and say, what the heck is going on here? And why is it so low? Well, here's the reason. When you drape the LIDAR images over it, the LIDAR survey that we had, it shows there's a flat top mesa of sandstone on top of the thing sitting here and another flat top mesa sitting over here. So you're not going to get anything because that sandstone, which is full of quartz, there's no copper in it, nothing at all. So you get no response on there and no response on there. And we suspect remnants of it are still left there and over here as well. So you get a subdued uh, response. So that explains that. Now, this is very, very important to understand. And here's why. OK, this is um, a published uh, map from the Mirador uh, Porphy Copper, which is in production today. Now, look at this thing. So um, you can look at it in detail later, but essentially it's outlining the grades here, 0.4% copper in red. But this yellow blob here is onlapping Hoyin quartz sandstone, just like we have the mesas that you just saw in the last image. In this case, it's just clipping the edge, the, the southwestern edge of Mirador and covering it over, right? So this is in production, big open pit here now. But as I said, this rock came in later and it's flat lying, lying on top of everything else. That's important, and here's why. When you look at the cross section of Mirador, this is what you see. So you have leached zone up here. You have enriched zone down here, right? And then where the streams have cut down, where the ravines are, you have nothing because that stuff's been stripped off. So you just have your typical porphyry style underneath exposed. But this enriched zone is what makes the thing profitable because typical enriched zone will be anywhere from three to five times the grade of the underlying porphyry. It is naturally upgraded. How does that work? Well, this area up here gets leached, so the copper gets removed by rainwater. It gets moved downwards, percolates downwards, and it ends up uh, essentially down here, and it forms what we call a copper blanket. Now, in the case of Mirador, only bits of this are preserved because a lot of it's been eroded away. Now, but the pieces that are here, 
And the ones, the porphyries to the south don't have any of this stuff. It's completely eroded away. But the reason that this even exists is because that sandstone lies very, very close to it. So the sandstone, until fairly recently, geologically speaking, would have covered over this whole thing. And what we call armored, armored it, prevented the erosion from cutting down and removing it. This is very important to understand because this is your goody zone up here. And we think that it's sinking one, two, three, four. We have copper blanket preserved and the whole thing is intact. The drill will tell us what we've got, but it's very, very exciting. Sedimentary style copper. Now what happens here? 20% of the world's copper supply is actually from sedimentary hosted copper. You, may have not even heard of sedimentary hosted copper, but there is a very, very famous deposit called the Kuferschiefer in Germany and Poland. It uh, was mined since the 11th century in Germany. It only shut down uh, during uh, uh, reunification, but in, uh, in Poland now there are five operating mines uh, from KGHM, the National Mining Company, and they're mining down the dip of this thing. So the thing is getting deeper as you move from across Germany and into Poland, and into Poland it's like 800 to 1200 meters down, but very, very profitable because of the grades, and the grades are very similar to what we're getting. So in outcrop, we've got 4.4% copper, 51 grams per ton silver, and it occurs over a whopping 23 kilometers. This is what it looks like. You can see the beds in here. This is a piece that's been broken in half. So it's a mirror image. And the black here is a mineral called calcasite, which is a copper sulfide mineral. The, the green here is malachite. That's, uh, so it's oxidizing. It's going to copper carbonates. And this stuff is 3.62% copper and 104 grams per ton silver with a gross metal value of $289 a ton. Nothing to be sneezed at. Great stuff. Uh, you know, even if we find only a small part of our 23 kilometers is potentially uh, economic, then we're in the pound seats, as they say in Britain. This is what the stuff looks like, uh, you know, when they're, the boys find it in streams, uh, big, big chunks. This is five centimeters across here, 4.3% copper, 48 grams per ton silver and sandstone. Silver is always pretty significant in this stuff. Here's another piece here, 6.4% copper, 48 grams silver. Often there is carbon, carbonaceous fragments, fossils, pieces of plant material, uh, woody fragments. It's all gone to carbon, like charcoal. And this actually formed a bed here. It was kind of in a swampy area, carbon-bearing layer. And um, the porphyries would have come up and then groundwater and other things are distributing the copper around la 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 and then um, it ends up because these red beds are full of salt uh, nacl table salt um, it, they're reactive and they move the copper around it forms copper sulfate which is a, a, a liquid and uh, it ends up uh, when it comes in con contact with these carbon layer, layer uh, bearing layers it gets chemically reduced, it drops out of, of, uh, of solution, and it forms a nice, uh, more or less flat line copper body. Uh, this is something that the geologists came up with. Uh oh, I don't know how that went. Sorry. <laughs> but that was a, a, an image, um, you can go back to it and just freeze it. But uh, a two and a half kilometer strike length of copper uh, and um, dipping down to the east, dipping down so that it was uh, within a, a couple of hundred meters, it was already 200 meters down. So you'd have to drill, have to drill to find the extension of this to depth to see where it's going. Now, very, very important thing here. So if you've been following our press releases, you know that we have, uh, we have um, applied for the rights to uh, more than 400,000 hectares of ground in Peru, across the border. Uh, we would have loved to have uh, just 
uh, found the continuation, staked up the continuation of the belt here. But unfortunately, that's National Park. It's off limits. And um, so we had to make do with uh, these yellow zones in here where our concession applications are. There are a bunch of other parks in here. Some of the land's been taken up by other people as well. So we haven't been able to just get a nice big block like we had in here. But nevertheless, uh, what we've done strategically is to go after the same stratigraphy, the same rocks, the same horizon as we have up here in Ecuador, which we know to be copper bearing. The names change when you go across the border because that's what happens when you get into another country, but the rocks are the same and you can follow the belt all the way down here. And there was a discovery made down in this area by another company. And when we recognized the situation, we said, well, hell, we're just gonna fill in the gap here. Why don't we? And uh, cause we know exactly what we're dealing with here. And uh, it was strategic. We picked that ground up. It's not been awarded to us yet, but our idea is to uh, integrate it with a lot of the seismic and um, and mapping that has been done by the oil companies because carbon bearing sediments are also sediments that are conducive to have oil and gas in them. And this area has been heavily looked at by uh, oil companies in Peru. And now all that data is public domain. So we're gathering it up, we're looking at it, and we're gonna pick out a whole pile of targets from it. And uh, from what we learn up in this area, we're going to extrapolate it down here and hopefully uh, find another 23 kilometer, even longer uh, zone of sedimentary hosted copper silver through here. So that'd be a great thing. Now, finally, the, uh, the Lost Cities, where are we with that? And I said, uh, again, we're chasing uh, down two lost gold settlements, Logroño de los Caballeros, Sevilla de Oro, these are referred to in the literature actually as ciudades, cities, though they were never actually cities in our sense. The Spanish, I think, were being a little bit optimistic. But, um, you know, as I said, this has been getting a lot of play in the press. This is from the Northern Miner. This is the gentleman who actually introduced me to the concept back in 1998. And uh, we worked on it for 10 years. We spent uh, two years in the archive of the Indies in Seville. Uh, we went to the Vatican twice and uh, we went to uh, the Biblioteca Nacional in Madrid, all the archives within Ecuador. We went to Lima to the archives there. We found uh, over 500 documents, contemporary documents relating to Logroño and Sevilla de Oro, documenting um, what was found there, um, people who defended it, um, various skirmishes with, uh, uh, with the natives back in the day and um, what eventually happened to them. Uh, very, very unfortunately for the indigenous people, uh, as you probably aware, um, they had no immunity to diseases like, um, uh, like uh, well, not the COVID, because that's, that's a new thing, but um, things like smallpox, uh, very serious diseases. And, uh, and it wiped them out. 92% uh, of the area was depopulated, very, very sadly. Uh, the Spaniards were using them as forced labor. They lost their labor force. Uh, they petitioned the crown to send African uh, slaves um, from West Africa to the area. And that never happened, uh, fortunately for them. Um, and the Spaniards just walked away and they abandoned the Eastern side of the Andes. They stayed on the West for the duration of the empire. And nobody went back to the eastern side until it was um, investigated by uh, Catholic and, and, and Jesuit, or Franciscan and Dominican uh, missionaries and um, back in the 1860s, 1870s. So a long, long period of time after the, uh, the last Spaniards had, had left the area. And that's essentially why they're lost. A book that I found in the Vatican from 1628, um, fantastic document, uh, and um, it documents, you, you can read it here, 
it says mention Sevilla de Oro right there in the title to this um, this chapter in the province of Macus. Macus is a town that still exists. It's very close by. It talks about here uh, being close to the real Opano. It's actually uh, Yama Opano called Opano. It's called now the Upano. Um, it talks here about the destruction of Logroño de las Caballeros, and it says here, La tierra más rica de oro que hay en todas las Indias. The earth is richer in gold than all of the Indies. And I didn't write it, and it wasn't written by a mining promoter. It was written in 1627 by a Carmelite priest. So uh, he's, he's not going to lie to you or me. <laughs> so interesting stuff, and uh, we're, we are trying to track it down. In addition to everything else that we have found through conventional scientific exploration. We're doing LIDAR surveys, and you saw that has been used to great effect uh, over the porphyries. But look at this. This is what the canopy looks like. You strip off the canopy in a virtual manner with the LIDAR, and this is what it looks like underneath. And this is potentially the scar of an old mine on a vein. We were just about to investigate this. We actually had the people in the field. They were only about a half hour away when the order came from the government uh, to shut down. We had to send a helicopter in to pick them up. So this is still uh, to be investigated. Wait and see. We'll see what we get. We have a number of these targets. So uh, finally, as I've said, uh, our um, our uh, we are very much com committed to our host communities. Uh, we work with the uh, the Schwar community every day of the week. Uh, I have a private foundation, which is mentioned here. Uh, and we do a number of, uh, of things that uh, really are not appropriate for spending the investor's money. Um, stuff that, uh, you know, uh, my, uh, my boss from the early 1980s would have said is fluff, uh, but I think it's extremely important on a personal level. And so I'm going to do it uh, and, uh, and take over from the company. And that's including some of the uh, education initiatives and working with the Ministry of Foreign, the Ministry of Social Inclusion. We have a very good relationship with them. Uh, very finally, this is um, kind of the most popular thing that we've done for the communities, which was a, uh, a big soccer tournament we held over the course of a couple of months last year. It's called Waristai. Uh, there's a little girl there trying to get into the picture little boy here who can't can't stand to, to be left on his own and we had various um, we, we equipped the the villages with uh, with uniforms they had both in men men's and women's teams and uh, it was a fantastic fantastic event not just for our company but also for the community and the very first time I think in the history of this part of Ecuador that the communities had actually got together and uh, and interacted. What a wonderful thing. So that finishes it off for us. Uh, you want to get a hold of me personally, that's my email right there. Fire away with any questions you've got or take a look at our video series. We've got a lot of stuff on our website and I very I welcome uh, any questions you might have. Thank you for your attention. I'm going to have finish off my glass of wine. Santé. Have a great day. Thank you.